previously at Chester Zoo. There you go. Be careful. Headkeeper Alan Woodward was helping Tejas, the Asiatic lion cub, learn about the world outside his den. He's definitely behaving like a lion now. Today, Alan counts down his final days with Tejas before the cub leaves for another zoo. The next week's going to be very difficult, and I've been thinking about that day for a long time. At the giraffe house, there's a ray of hope for the tiny premature calf that's been struggling to feed. She started to suck and took nearly a pint down in one feed within two minutes. And Patna the rhino will be getting a girlfriend, so the keepers deploy high technology to prepare for her arrival. Tejas, come on. At Chester Zoo's lion enclosure, headkeeper Alan Woodward is giving Tejas his morning exercise and a chicken for breakfast. The Asiatic lion cub is now just over four months old and he weighs 18 kilos. He's growing up fast. As you can see, his, his mane is actually starting to grow now. Just around there, you can see a bit of a rough. I have to be careful it doesn't nip my fingers at the moment, but he's, uh, he's very well behaved. I mean, sometimes he's very possessive over his chicken, but he's, he's not too bad today. He likes coming up onto the platforms, um, but he likes exploring the whole of the enclosure. He, he chases the birds a lot. The first time he came out, he was absolutely terrified of the monorail going over, but now he actually chases that as well. Because of his age, he's into everything at the moment. I mean, he's, he's looking out for things to do. I mean, he carries a lot of the logs off, and uh, he's just like a, an overgrown, playful kitten, really. The problem comes when the overgrown kitten decides to play with the TV crew. Teach us. Teach us. No. <laughs> Teach us. Bad boy. No. Get off. No. 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 Teach us. No. There's no harm done, except to the researcher's dignity. There we go. Your turn now. <laughs> in a week's time, Tejas will leave Chester to go to a zoo in France. He's one of only nine Asiatic lion cubs in Europe, so when he's fully mature, he will be mated with two females in the hope that he will produce cubs of his own. The reason that Tejas can't stay with us is because we haven't really got the room. We've already got a breeding pair of Asiatic lions, so obviously we, we, we cannot house another male Asiatic lion. And he's actually required elsewhere to, to go on and carry on the, the gene pool in, in another collection, which, which is what it's all about, really. It'll be the place where he's actually going to grow up in, and it's important to settle him as soon as possible now, rather than leave it any longer and he'll be a lot older. And um, so he's about the right age now to, to, to start the growing up process, really. Alan hand-reared Tejas, and he's been with him almost every day since he was born. The special bond between them will be hard to break. This is the worst part of being the keeper, I think, because you have your job to do, you've got your emotional ties as well, and it's like a counteraction between them both. And obviously you can't do your job properly unless you, you are emotionally involved with your animals. I feel if you're too detached, you can't do your job properly. By actually understanding your animals, you, you know what's going on. And it's so difficult not to come attached to an animal like Tejas. He's been so charismatic and, and he's had his, his little fan club as well, really. And people, I mean, people have been coming in twice a week to, to see them and they've actually watched him grow up. So the next week's going to be very difficult and I've been thinking about that day for a long time and it's a day, to be honest, I, I don't really want to come, but I know it's going to come quite soon now. Later on, Bet James visits Zach the tapir to check whether the latest surgery has worked. That's where he did have his lung, and you can just see the, just the remnants of it. Over by the zoo's main entrance, headkeeper Chas McKenzie and senior keeper Shane Blake are two oh, yeah. men on a mission. Well, that's a grand day for it then, isn't it? Aye, can't wait to catch them big fish. Yeah. 
Shane has an unusual catch in mind, a greater one-horned rhino. Chester Zoo's young male, Patna, is about to get a female companion and potential mate called Batchy. With fewer than two and a half thousand one-horn rhinos left in the wild, Chester Zoo is keen to contribute to zoo breeding programmes. We've been waiting for Batchy since September last year. Uh, it's been a long, a long wait. Uh, of course, he didn't know that she was arriving, so he hasn't missed her at all yet, so we haven't told him. We, we hope in a few years' time, uh, possibly about three years because they're that young, they, they will start breeding uh, and we can have uh, baby Indian rhinos. Then, uh, then we, we're doing our bit for the conservation. But first, we've got to get her here and we've got to get them together before uh, any of that can happen. Batchy is being transported in a huge lorry. To ensure her arrival goes smoothly, Chaz has devised a highly scientific process consisting of two men and some sticks. So we are just going to check part of the route that's coming into the zoo to make sure that it, uh, the vehicle get, can get under and round by the trees. The height, height wise, is about four metres. We're not actually worried about the length, length as such, but as long as uh, we can get, get it under this monorail, it'll be fine. We've made the sticks slightly bigger than the truck by a few inches. Uh, if the worst case scenario comes and uh, we can't get the truck under, we could actually let the air out of the tyres, which drops, drops the truck by a few inches as well. So there's also that option. Clear. Tons of room there. Fine. With the monorail safely navigated, Chaz and Shane check the rest of the route. The truck is that wide, which is supposed to be... Oh, what's that now? Three metres, two metres? Chaz assesses whether the trees might obstruct the lorry. That one there. But it's small enough that we can probably lift that one over the top, because we don't want to be uh, chopping branches down and stuff like that there, because they're nice trees as well, so I don't think the gardeners would be very pleased. That's looking pretty good now. I don't think we have any major problems at all. Although Batchy is expected soon, transferring yeah, animals there, between right. zoos Gee. is a complex process Captain prone Jesse. to delays. Yeah. Chaz is keeping his excitement in check. Yeah, I've been excited for, for ages about this, but, uh, yeah, I'm not holding my breath again, you know, like something might uh, go in and spoil it again, so I'll, I'll wait until I hear the vehicle's on its way. Patna, meanwhile, is none the wiser that his bachelor days are numbered. <coughs> Resident vet James Chatterton and his colleagues are at the tapir house to make a final check on Zach, the young tapir. Over the last few weeks, Zach has had two lots of surgery okay. to remove an infected lump from his chin. He started to associate the vets with unpleasant things happening to him and became especially wary of James. I think he's learning to know my face. I don't think there's many of the zoo animals that appreciate the vet turning up. Today, James wants to work on regaining Zach's trust. And he knows the way to Zach's heart is through his stomach. He still likes you. Bit of bribery now. Exactly. So I'm trying to have a feel of Zach's lump now. Senior keeper Helen Massey has been flushing Zach's wound to keep it clean. And now James needs to check it's healing properly. Finish your carrot first, then. So obviously Zach's had an abscess under his chin, which looks like it's almost totally resolved now. And he has been a bit reluctant to let to let us have a feel. He's obviously been fine with Helen examining it and flushing it every day. So we've just been trying to to come at feed time when he's a little bit more relaxed and he's a bit he's a bit more distracted. James's charm offensive is definitely paying dividends. Compared to how he was immediately after the, the two lots of surgery when I couldn't get really within four or five feet of him and now he'll let me come up. Please, Zachy, you've been very good today. Zach is due to be transferred to another zoo to leave more space for his baby sister, Shadow. He needs a clean bill of health for the transfer to go ahead. That's where he did have his lung. And you can just see that just the remnants of it, just a, a slight swelling there still. 
but I suspect that's just scar tissue. So everything looks promising so far. With no sign of the problem recurring, Zach will soon be ready to make the move to his new home. At Chester Zoo's giraffe house, headkeeper Tim Rowlands is dealing with having a tiny, premature calf in the herd. Faye's baby wasn't able to suckle from her, and during this critical time, Tim kept the rest of the herd inside so they would learn to accept the baby. Now, at last, things are looking up. We've let these guys out now. Um, they've been in for four days since uh, Faye gave birth. And we need to keep them in as a group. They don't tend to do very well when one's in with the youngster and the rest are outside. Weather's not been great, so it's not been an issue for us having them in. Male's been a little wound up because he wants to get out and be active. Um, but everything's going along nicely now. So we've let them out, stretched their legs, have a run round. It's a massive turnaround since Tim reluctantly decided he'd have to hand rear the calf in order to get some food into her. He used every trick that he knew to get her to accept bottle feeds, but only had limited success. When we left last night, um, the calf wasn't suckling, um, but I did think there was something there that was giving me a little bit of hope, and I thought about it a lot last night. Um, didn't sleep particularly well, so decided to come in around midnight and try another bottle and just spend a bit of time with her. Um, and that went, that went nicely, you know, didn't get any food into her, but uh, there was just a nice time with her because she was looking for somebody at the time. Um, then came in early this morning and she fought me to start with when I put the bottle in her mouth again. But within 10, 20 seconds, um, she started to take the bottle. She started to suck and took nearly a pint down in one feed within two minutes, which is a big difference than the hour forced to put exactly the same down yesterday. So yeah, a lot more positive than I was yesterday. And it's just another one, next hurdle out the way. Yes, we made the decision, I made the decision to pull. Um, I, I strongly believe it was the right one for the giraffe and for, um, for us to do. Um, once that decision's made, you just have to get on and do it. And then the next one is to make sure that you bond and she's suckling, which we got today, so... No, that's, that's a big headache over. Later on, the appearance of Joyce at the kangaroo enclosure puts a spring in Keeper Andy's step. They're such a fantastic species, you know, it's the, they're so bizarre. It's mealtime for Chester Zoo's black and white rough lemurs, and senior keeper Jason Boyer has a bowl full of treats. OK, little guys. They might be just the thing for Xander, a young male who's had a tough time over the last few days. When Xander seemed under the weather, the zoo vets diagnosed a throat infection. What it is is an area of inflamed tissue on the roof of his mouth that goes a little way down his, his esophagus, like a laryngitis. When he was better, he was reintroduced, only to find himself frozen out of his gang. The keepers hoped he'd be accepted again soon. Now, Xander has recovered completely from his sore throat, but his social life isn't so healthy. The rest of his group never accepted him back, so he and his brother Angelus have been separated from the group for their own well-being. When you take a lemur out of a group, unlike a lot of other uh, higher primates, you, you can generally get a little bit of trouble when putting them back in. In the wild, lemurs like Xander live in groups of two to five, dominated by females. Jason can't be sure why Xander's been rejected, but as he's due to move to another zoo soon, the keepers decided it was best not to force his reintroduction. If we were going to keep him here, we'd have persisted a little longer. And eventually, we should be able to have got him back in the group. But as he was due to go, uh, it was just easier to save the stress and keep them separated just for a couple of weeks. Angelus will be good company for Xander while the pair wait for their move. And the upheaval doesn't seem to have done Xander any harm. He's pretty much back to his normal self. Uh, he's eating well. Uh, 
full of energy and basically there's no difference now between him and his brother. So it's just a matter of waiting for the, all the paperwork to come through so we can uh, move him to the other zoo. Okay, so I'll put the food out for the rest of the uh, group and let them back in. Xander and Angelus are separated from their former companions by wire mesh. And once it's in, the big group is quick to make its presence felt. The lemurs are quite territorial in their vocal animals. Basically, it's just telling other lemurs if it was a wild situation that this is their territory and they're about. Xander and his brother will be safe from bullying behind their mesh. And soon they should have a new gang that will be much more friendly. At the old orangutan house, Tuan, the male Bornean orangutan, has surprised and delighted his keepers. Tuan was brought to Chester Zoo in the hope he would father babies for three females, Sariki, Martha and Leah. Tuan's first introduction to Sariki went well and they mated without a hitch. To observe them now, if you didn't know, you, you could have thought that those orangutans had been together for years. But senior keeper Chris Yarwood was worried that things would be much harder with the other two. Leia had never been with a male before, and Martha might resent a new male arriving on her territory. We can get two orangutans that absolutely hate each other and, uh, and aren't happy to share the same space. Chris expected the introductions to Leah and Martha to be a delicate, gradual process, but he's glad to have been proved wrong. Martha amazed us all when she, um, she decided she, to get a, a little bit frisky with Tuan almost immediately. Um, yeah, I don't think any of us would have put money on that happening. And about three or four days ago, um, Tuan's also mated Leah. So he's mated all three of them. So we don't know if it's because they're in season or whether it's just to, to appease the male with the, the initial introduction. But um, we'll, we'll watch their uh, progress over the coming months. But yeah, he's, he's happily mating all three of them. So um, by the end of 2008, we might have three baby born Ian orangutans. And um, yeah, if that happens, it'll be fantastic. It will be several weeks before pregnancies can be confirmed. But Chris knows that any baby orangutan will be worth the wait. It's turned into a beautiful afternoon at Chester Zoo, and the kangaroos are making the most of the weather. Kangaroos live in groups of up to 15, known as mobs. In the wild, they graze on grass and shrubs. But today, keeper Andy Wolfenden as something more exotic for them. On, Foster, off you go. In Australia, male kangaroos are affectionately known as stinkers because they have a distinctive smell. Happily, it's nothing to do with what Andy's feeding them. We've got bread, bananas, apple pears, some lettuce in there, and some macropod diet, which is um, a sort of dried food. And uh, that's got everything that the bread and the, the fruit doesn't supply, all the extra vitamins in there. These are grey kangaroos, they're the biggest species of kangaroo. The, the big male, we've got uh, Buster here, um, he's very old, he's, he's about 15 years old at the moment. Uh, you can start to see his, his fur starting to look a little bit dull and he's starting to be, uh, get a bit shaggy, but um, he's still fathering all the joeys this year. This time of year they start to just stick their heads out and have a look around and then within probably another couple of weeks, a month's time, they'll be out, out onto the paddock. But they'll still go back to the pouch to about 12 months um, to sleep and also if anything scares them as well. Kangaroos breed all year round, but the mother has the ability to retain a fertilised egg in the womb for up to seven months. It enables the mother to produce joys when good weather and food are most plentiful and almost like a production line. At any one time, a female can have three joeys. Um, she can have a, a joey that's still suckling, uh, but has already left the pouch and doesn't go back anymore. Uh, they'll suckle for anywhere up to 14, 15 months. 
Uh, you can have a, a joey that's still in the pouch that comes in every now and then to have a sleep or when it feels threatened. You can always have, also have one of the, the fetal joeys, um, which are going to be about the size of a jelly bee, maybe a little bit bigger, so they can constantly be um, reproducing. When the joey is sort of nine, ten months old, it's a very tight fit in the pouch, so it's, it does look very awkward and ungainly, but obviously it offers a lot of protection. So when, when the joey's in there, it doesn't matter how it's in there, but you, you do see these legs sprouting out from the middle of the mum and heads coming out between legs and things like that. So it, it does look uncomfortable, but obviously it's serving a purpose. They're such a fantastic species, you know, it's, they're, they're so bizarre. With 7,000 animals at Chester Zoo, it's reckoned a baby is born here virtually every day. But for Andy and his colleagues, the arrival of the joeys is still something special. It's a lovely time, especially if we see something like the, the joeys coming out for the first time. We'll radio up the other team members and if they're free, they'll come up and we'll see it as well. Um, you know, it's, it's a nice part of the job where we can sort of sit back for five minutes and, and just watch what the animals are doing. Next time, there's a worrying setback and headkeeper Tim has to call in the vet to treat the baby giraffe. Yeah, that doesn't look terribly healthy. No. Holy tummy. And when Batchi, the rhino from Switzerland, finally arrives at Chester, she gets the warmest of welcomes. It's been a long, long journey, hasn't it, for you? Two days on the go, Batchi. It's definitely been worth it. <laughs>